So friends, welcome to the lecture series on debates in Indian politics. We are continuing the readings of an intellectual history of the study of Indian politics. written by Rudolf and Rudolfs and we are starting with Edward Schill's commentaries on the intellectual scenario in India. As I told you in the previous lecture, American sociologist Edward Schill's has come out with a volume on or an ethnography on India's intellectuals and he titled his essay The Intellectuals Between Tradition and Modernity The Indian Situation and in this essay friends uh, Edward Schultz was had the opinion Edward Schultz had the opinion that India's political science is in a standstill or in a dormant stage. After Gandhi, no new components have been introduced in India's political science. And he attributed the dominance of bureaucracy in India's public life as a reason for the decline of political science in India's intellectual scenario. And he argued, Edward Schultz argued that in the decade following independence, what happened in India's public life was the fact that India's political science or academic political science was overshadowed by the public intellectuals in the government and politics. Therefore, he Schultz, appeared to say that India was on the rim of a philosopher king because in India, public intellectuals are also holding so much administrative and political responsibilities in India, which you cannot find, no, you can find nowhere in the world. You can't find it in USA, nor in Britain, nor in other European countries. In India, political class is also the intellectual class. And just not only confined only to Nehru, he was referring to political leadership who was also public intellectuals. He was referring to Ajarya Narendra Dev, Ajarya J.B. Kripalini, Ashok Mehta, Jay Prakash Narayan of Praja Socialist Party, Kirendra Nath Mukherjee of the Communist Party, but she's pointed out that, sorry, uh, Rudolf and Rudolf pointed out that Edward Schultz did not mention about EMS Nambudiri part. He was also a public intellectual, but he was also the chief minister of Kerala. And also Rudolf had a disappointment in the fact that Edw Edward Schultz did not figure out the name of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar India's law minister who was also a public intellectual and she's also do uh, documented you know Ram Manohar Lohia etc who was also India's public intellectuals they they 
hold positions of power also that's why edward shills had the opinion that india was on the uh, was near close to the idea of a philosopher king state and not only this in the early decades after india became independent what happened is that the brightest students who graduated from indian universities preferred civil service as their career so the brightest well read better minds of india went to indian civil service indian bureaucracy and they also held positions in commissions and com uh, committees like university grants commission or uh, indian council of social science research so all these organizations became some kind of a bureaucratic structure where bureaucrats held very influential position thereby what happened in india was that in the years following or in the decades following india became independent political science was not able to produce good intellectuals it was not able to shape public policies it was not able to influence how the policies are being formulated and one of the main reasons according to edward shills and his ethnography of indian intellectuals is that nehru's commanding position in india's public life in a sense was a restraint for political scientist to present a parallel to nehru and also rudolf argued that in the march 1950 march 1950 planning commission was established and friends planning commission visualized in india through planned development and rudolf argued that the idea of a planned develop planned development which is implemented through a planning commission inhibited the growth of political science in india academic political science did not find place in the first two five year plans the first five year plan adopted a gandhian model of agrarian society development of an agrarian society and second five year plan gave emphasis to an agrarian model of industrial society and you will see friends in this scenario economics played very vital role in shaping india's nation india's economy and as a consequence india society too a ugc survey in the year 1982 presented a detailed review of ba and ma curriculum in political science which stated that there were no courses on political economy there were no courses on political economy and this in fact impeded the growth of political science as a policy science that can shape the future of india and myron weiner myron weiner in a ford foundation review argued that who, st uh, who studied india social science who studied india social science scenario argued that very few individuals very few individuals in the government in the government are open minded they are able to uh, fund research projects they are responsive to research they are able to understand 
the requirements of academic community but wiener pointed out that the majority of people in the indian bureaucracy were closed minded that's why social science was not developing in india the bureaucrats had a condemn to social science and you know nehru was very much aware of this problem nehru was very much aware of this problem that india's bureaucracy is not responsive to promoting social science research therefore he invited the syracuse professor paul h appleby to look into the problems of indian bureaucracy which impede good social science research uh, good you know uh, you know funding for social research or how bureaucracy become a stumbling block to good social engineering and it was the suggestion of paul chapel by the indian institute of public administration was formed and pn masaldan pn masaldan was a weighty figure in the indian bureaucracy had presented a two volume book on planning in uttar pradesh and mv madhu the founder of the department of public administration at the university of rajasthan participated numerous national expert policy bodies but these are a few exceptions friends these were few exceptions except uh, the uh, slight participation of public administration intellectuals into policy bodies most of the policy bodies were dominated by india's bureaucrats and to some extent economists and it was in this background friends economics as a discipline in the years following independence became so dominant in india this is not the scenario in other societies if you go to usa or to britain or to other european countries you cannot find this kind of a scenario where social science is dominating but in india what happened is that economics began to dominate because of the fact that nehru gave so much importance to planning commission and a planned india and in the planning commission economics got dominance and where there were very few sociologists and there were no political scientists there were no historians or there were no anthropologist and as a result friends there were sufficient demand for economist in the planning commission and economics economics became a weighty academic discipline and it got uh, popularity in india's mainstay in the years following independence and you will see that this high demand for economics also led to the establishment of you know the d school the delhi school of economics and you you, you already know that the delhi school of economics was founded on the basis of the famous london school of economics and political science and you see that lse is not Uh, confined only to economics it is also a school for political science and the title of that university is london school of economics and political science but the point is that when the d school was founded in india they removed the name political science and it was confined only to economics so the name the delhi school of economics and short form the d school and d school was founded under the commandship of vkr V K R V Rao. The D school ignored political science as an academic discipline since 1950s, and it privileged only economics, the growth of economics as an academic discipline in India. And history has been, uh, you know, rejected. Sociology has been rejected. Anthropology has been rejected, and it privileged only. economics as an academic discipline and kn raj for many years a professor there 
had the opportunity to meet Nehru every year to talk about the activities of the D school. And Nehru had a very keen interest in the activities in the D school. And he offered all the help for the growth of this institution in India. And friends, you will see that by 1970s, 1970s, what happened in India is that economics began to dominate as a commanding academic social science discipline in India and which produced a number of world-class intellectuals and which you cannot find in other social sciences like political science or history or sociology or anthropology. And economics got a commanding height in India by 1970s and they produced the economics because of the influence of D school the Delhi School of Economics, where so many professors were employed and they got so much funds for research, social science research, economic research, were able to produce number of books, articles, and they got a commanding position in India's public life, public intellectual life. And what happened is that by 1970s, India produced some world-class economists, which you cannot find in other social sciences. It was only because of the establishment of D school. And you will see, some of the leading stalwarts of D school, like Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen was in the D school, who migrated to London School of Economics, Oxford University, and Harvard University, later became a Nobel laureate. That was only because, friends, uh, India had a D school. And Jagadish Bhagavadi, you know, who became a famous professor in Columbia University or Taban Rai Choudhury, who became a professor in the Oxford University, or T.N. Srinivasan, who became a professor in Yale University, or Pranab Bardhan, who became a professor in University of California, Berkeley. And some other professors stayed at home. Some other professors who stayed at home, or I mean, in India, uh, who became very influential in, in India's public intellectual life, like K.N. Raj and uh, Sugamoy Chakravarti and KN Raj founded uh, Trivandrum based uh, CDS, Center for Development Studies, which is also a very powerful you know, uh, research institution in India, which is centered in Trivandrum. And KN Raj was its key figure. Dharma Kumar, Raj Krishna, they are you know, economists who stayed at home. And some of the economists who migrated to world class financial institutions like World Bank. And Amartya Sen, uh, sorry, you know, I mean, Manmohan Singh is an example who later became the Prime Minister of India and also before that the Finance Minister of India. And friends, uh, these kinds of financial institutions, in a sense, accommodated sociology. They accommodated sociology. In the 50s and 60s, you will see that these institutions accommodated sociology and even uh, India's IITs also. You can see that sociology is as an accepted, uh, you know, uh, a popular social science discipline where you can also find that political science has been rejected. But friends, this is only an Indian scenario. Nowhere you can find that this rejection of uh, political science as an academic dis discipline from uh, the public intellectual institutions where in other societies be it usa or europe or some other you know australia or some other part of the world you will you can you can't see that political science uh, you know you know in the periphery of uh, periphery of academic institutions but the thing is that in india political science has been neglected and it was because of the acceptance of sociology as an academic discipline which should be studied along with economic policies, along with science policies. Sociology departments were also incorporated in the IITs and other financial institutions. And you will see that it was because of this acceptance, sociology as an academic discipline was able to produce some good intellectuals and good books and good academic journals. And you will see M. N. Srinivas, Andre Betel, T. N. Madan attained some national prominence as a very good academics and sociology produced very good intellectuals. 
in that sense. M. N. Srinivasan, for example, or Andre Betel, for example. And friends, Ramendra Guha, uh, who got a position in uh, D school as a sociologist, uh, who uh, said that when he got an offer from Delhi School of Economics as a research researcher, he rejected that you know uh, offer because he was not interested in pursuing a Delhi-based academic uh, professorial life because he was believing that in Delhi it was highly politicized scenario. That's why he later migrated to Bengaluru, where he started uh, began to write and became one of India's prominent public intellectuals, Ramendra Guha. And he had a condom for Delhi-based academics. And friends, it was uh, the Calcutta University and the University of Bombay, which in the 1940s started, as I told you in the beginning, uh, a political science department. But friends, it was in 1963, Political science got its own a think tank for the first time. It was in a Delhi based uh, Center for Studies in Developing Societies, short form CSDS. That was in 1963. Rajini Kotari, who started, uh, launched the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. And Center for Study CSDS is instrumental in shaping social sciences in India, particularly political science. And friends, when we look upon what political scientists studied in the early years of its uh, inception, you will see that institutionalism dominated. Rudolf say, uh, was saying that institutionalism dominated the studies of political science in India. And India was partitioned in 1947. But political science began to study the causes of partition only in the 80s and 90s. Rudolf say, uh, saying that, Rudolf, Rudolf were saying that political science, academic political science started studying why India was partitioned and the, what are the major factors, social factors uh, that, you know, led to the bifurcation of India into Pakistan and India uh, was a subject of study, inquiry, social research within political science only in the 80s and uh, 90s because it was only in the 80s political science got some kind of recognition. And you will see political scientists in the 80s started to write about, uh, you know, the question of state formation, not only union government, state government, the structure of powers of state governments, local self-government institutions, federal system, Supreme Court and social change, as well as the rights of Indian citizens and other, you know, some other very interesting questions of politics and governance. And much of these writings were centered around institutional approach, how institutions are being shaped state government, federal structure, union government, local self-government, Supreme Court. These were the concerns of early political science research. And based on this, you will see that some early books, political science produced some early books, but these were not written by Indians. You will see Oxford professor Reginald Copeland, Reginald Copeland has written in 1944, a report on the constitutional problem in India. In 1944, you will see the Oxford, famous Oxford professor, Reginald Coupland has written something about India's constitutional process. It was titled, Report on the Constitutional Problem in India. And Arthur Beridel Keith, Arthur Beridel Keith, in 1936, has written a book on the constitutional history of India, the constitutional history of India. And these were not constitutional theories. These were not abstract theories, but these were books based on practical 
or pragmatic concerns. Clear? So, these works and its authors consider the legislative empowerment of colonial society by the British state. They studied how the colonial society has been empowered by the legislative initiatives of the Raj in India, British Raj in India. And they have studied things like Indian Council Acts of 1909 based on the Morley Mindo reforms, otherwise Mindo Morley reforms, or the Montague Chemsworth reform, Montague Chemsworth reform, and also Government of India Act 1935. And how these writers began to inquire how these reform initiatives, how these acts shaped colonial society in British Raj. But friends, the most important books which for many years shaped the idea of a modern India, a future India, in India's public consciousness was written by Jawaharlal Nehru. And Nehru's book, such as Glimpses of World History, an autobiography, The Discovery of India. First, these books had a commanding influence in India's public intellectual life, which shaped the modality, the ideas, the thought process of India's early political classes. And it also formed the basis of syllabus in India's social science disciplines. And his daughter, Indira Gandhi, in the 1980, made a foreword to the discovery of India. And in that foreword to Discovery of India, Indira Gandhi has written like this. I may read for you. My father's three books, Glimpses of World History, an autobiography, and the Discovery of India, have been my companion through life. Indeed, Glimpses was written for me. A father has written a book exclusively for his daughter. How interesting, how sweet it is. Glimpses was written for me. It remains the best introduction to the story of man for young and growing people in India and all over the world. The autobiography has been acclaimed as not merely the cost of one individual for freedom, but as an insight into the making of the mind of new India. And she continues, the discovery delves deep into the sources of India's personality. Look at the words he, she used. The discovery delves deep into the sources of India's personality. Together these books, she was referring to three books, together these books, have molded a whole generation of Indians and inspired persons from many other countries. Friends, she was writing this in 1980 in a foreword to her father's book, The Discovery of India. And friends, what was interesting about Nehru's book was not so about Gandhi's books. And Gandhi's Hindu Swaraj, According to Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, he himself, Nehru himself critiqued Gandhi and he himself considered Gandhi as his uh, guru, but he criticized his guru's book and he was saying Hindu Suraj, about uh, Hindu Suraj, which was written in 1909, Nehru was saying that, that it was at best inconsequential. Nehru was saying that it was at best inconsequential. That was the word he used, inconsequential and it was misguided 
he was saying that kindu raj was misguided book and if not foolish if not foolish <laughs> this was what nehru said about you know uh, gandhi's book uh, hindu swaraj and friends and his satyagraha in south africa there is an another book but least known most of the people don't know anything about this book satyagraha in south africa that was written in 1928 remained unknown to the academic and to the students we still don't know anything about these books because it is not being studied in india but his book the story of my experience with the truth uh, you know you know uh, is very popular but it is not being uh, studied by university students or college students in india because this book is not a reference a study material for university students and so but it was nehru's book nehru's books are recommended for readings in india's university systems across india's university system not only in india also abroad in western universities nehru's book particularly discovery of india is uh, cited as one of the compulsory read so you know you know in india it was nehru and not gandhi uh, whose master narrative that is nehru's master narrative is about a nationalistic era about a future india uh, which had an ascending command over india's public mind friends and and you will see it was only uh, writers like you know ashish nandi partha chatterjee thomas pantham or bikhu parekh faisal dev ji margaret chatterjee akil bilgrami vineet harkar anthony parel these writers in the 1990s had revisited gandhi's writings they had revisited gandhi in 1990s and found that gandhi can be considered a post colonial uh, writer who had an alternative interpretation about the grand western meta narratives so gandhi had critiqued modernity gandhi had critiqued a uh, science gandhi had critiqued technology gandhi had critiqued nationalism uh, you know or uh, or you know, otherwise called you know modern medicine or uh, uh, grand western narratives and he had uh, a, a, a locally inspired what may be called a, a broad a, a broad minded world view uh, which is inspired by the local culture so uh, he presented a counter narratives to enlightenment a counter narratives to modernity a counter narratives to uh, modern world view and this, according to these writers are what may be called a post colonial reinterpretation of india from a gandhian perspective and it was only in 1990s gandhi was rediscovered but friends up to 1990 what we are going to see is that nehru had a commanding edge in the university syllabus and his perspectives about india dominated uh, the mentality of a generation of indians friends in this you know scenario political science as a, an intellectual academic discipline was not able to compete with nehru because no political scientist no political uh, no books in political science had such an influence which nehru had uh, in the indian mind which nehru had in the shaping of public opinion and morris jones friends morris jones began to study about india's constitutional process and he published what may be called the parliament in india in 1957 1957 he published a famous book parliament in india and it was also written in institutional perspective institutional perspective but friends uh, you know other than these books one of the most, most important books most students in social science disciplines uh, would prefer to read as a compulsory read was nehru's book discovery of india because which had an idea about uh, grand narratives about what india was and what india is and what india is going to be so that was a more sort of book about how india should look like in the future but it was you know uh, some kinds of uh, attempts were uh, initiated in the 50s and 60s in which some foreign writers began to write about india but they began they wrote about india from a institutional perspective that's why uh, books you can see the title of these books are institutional so for example you will see parliament in india 
that was written by Morris Jones. Or Morris Jones again published another very interesting book in the 1964. 1964. Uh, his first book was 1957 book, Parliament in India. And later he published Government and Politics in India, 1964 book. And in the 1970s, 1970s, this Morris Jones book was very influential books for a student of political science because you can consider these books are classic books about what India is, what India's constitutional process is, what India's uh, government and politics is. Uh, this is compulsory read because uh, he initiated some kinds of, uh, you know, what may be called attempt to understand politics in India. But in the 70s, you will see that Morris Jones was challenged in political science. In the 1970s, Morris Jones was challenged in, in, in the academic discipline of political science. That was in the 1970s. And some influential books began to appear. And one is Rajini Kothari's book, The Politics in India. That is a classic about India. That was uh, one of the most beautiful books ever written by an Indian intellectual about politics in India or the political process in India. So that's a compulsory read for uh, postgraduate students in political science. Uh, without understanding Rajini Kothari, you can't understand what is politics in India. So Rajini Kothari's books uh, is a reading for uh, uh, you in this syllabus. I think you will read the first chapter of Rajini Kothari. Uh, Rajini Kothari challenged the Morris Jones version of uh, India's politics. And uh, Robert L. Hardgrave, is a, a foreign writer, Ro Robert L. Hardgrave written another book, India, Government and Politics. India, Government and Politics of a Developing Nation. Government India, Government and Politics of a Developing Nation by Robert L. Hardgrave. And also, uh, friends, uh, Rudolf and Rudolf, uh, In Pursuit of Leshmi, In Pursuit of Leshmi. Uh, that book is also a reference for you. And one of the chapters of that book uh, is a compulsory read for you in this syllabus. And Rudolf and Rudolf has written uh, a book which challenged uh, the Morris Jones version of India's politics, India's political science. And you will see uh, a series of books about India's constitutional process uh, uh, began to appear in the academic scenes. And you will see Benagal, Benagal Rao writing India's constitution in the making, India's constitution in the making, and M. V. Piley in the 1960s has written constitutional government government in India. M. V. Piley has written constitutional government in India, and in 1967. At 1967, H.M. H.M. C.R.Y. H.M. C.R.Y.'s book, Constitutional Law of India, Constitutional Law of India, and Granville Austin's famous book, Granville Austin's very famous book, The Indian Constitution, Cornerstone of a Nation. One of the articles of that book is a reading for you in this uh, syllabus. Uh, Granville Austin's very famous 1966 book, The Indian Constitution, The Cornerstone of a Nation, provided a very comprehensive account of India's political science. And friends, in 2000, again, Granville Austin published another very interesting book, a very authoritative book uh, about five decades of India's independence. That's a very interesting book. Uh, and Rajiv Dhawan, uh, published Supreme Court, a work on Supreme Court, and Ubendra Bakshi published the Supreme Court and politics. Ubendra Bakshi's uh, writing is a, uh, a compulsory reader for you in this syllabus, and you will read one of the essays of Ubendra Bakshi. Uh, he's, a, he's a legal scholar. Ubendra Bakshi's The Supreme Court of India, Supreme, The Supreme Court and politics, The Supreme Court and politics, and Pradhabhanu Mehta, Pradhabhanu Mehta has written uh, something about India's uh, Supreme Court and uh, its watershed decisions, which shaped India's uh, you know, public mind. And you will see uh, in the 70s, so many writers began to write about inst public institutions and how their activities shaped society in India. But in the 80s, you will see Public interest litigation, public interest litigation attained the attention of scholarship and plenty of writers began to focus on that. 
ഉപേന്ദ്ര ബക്ഷി രാജീവ് ധവാൻ മാർക്ക് ഗാലറ്റ് ഷിഫ്റ്റഡ് ദർ അറ്റൻഷൻ ഫ്രം മൈക്രോ പോളിറ്റിക്സ് ടു മൈക്രോ പോളിറ്റിക്സ് to what happened in the local level what happened in the state what happened in the provincial level right as like ubendra bakshi rajiv dawan rajiv dawan and uh, mar garander began to look at what is going to happen in the provincial level or in the state level in local politics and they uh, shifted their attention from supreme court or parliament or government of india to uh, local concerns thereby uh, things like plenty of concerns uh, like you know you know you know uh, the, the the police rape in india police rape in india began to uh, find attention of political science research police rape in india police blindings ngo state confrontation ngo state confrontation corruption in public life jail in humanity or uh, or 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 uh, environmental uh, uh, environmental issues uh, these issues began to uh, get the attention of political science scholarship in the 80s and you will see friends in the 70s itself a behavior revolution took place in india a behavior revolution took place in india and majority of you might have studied behavior revolution post behavior revolution in the us political uh, science scenario and you will see uh, behavior revolution which happened in uh, usa which happened in usa also began to appear in india too behavior revolution uh, began to appear in india too in the 60s uh, in the same way so uh, the behavioral turn was welcomed by both academics both in usa and in india for similar reason what is the reason Uh, indian political science accepted behavior revolution uh, because of empiricism that is you can't understand society from your classrooms you can't understand society uh, from the high echelons of you know you know academic ladder rather you should come down you should come down you go to the street talk to the people understand the mind of the people so this is the idea of empiricism so this way political scientists began to come out of their preoccupation with the classical text they began to come out of their preoccupation with the classical text like reading plato reading karl marx or reading uh, hegel and they come out of that preoccupations and began to talk to pe- people and this revolution in a sense in india was initiated by rajini kothari and his uh, founding of uh, csds center for studies in developing societies in the 1963 and behavioralism friends behavioralism not only opened an avenue for a science of politics it not only opened an avenue for the science of politics it also contributed it also contributed towards liberating towards liberating india's intellectual life from the hold of brahmanical legacy friends that is a very important point india's early intellectuals are all brahmins their early intellectuals are all brahmins they had a brahmanic uh, you know you know lineage and this lineage for the first time was questioned in india in political science by behavior revolution so behavior revolution not only created a science of politics but it also uh, shifted away from the dominance of brahmanic intellectual intellectual supremacy in the academic discipline of political science and a counter narratives about brahmanical supremacy in the academic discipline of political science began to emerge so uh, you will see in the 1969 uh, you know a empirical movement started an empirical movement started in india and based on this uh, food lines of this empirical movement so many research empirical research oriented institutions were founded so many uh, empirical 
research oriented institutions were founded and their uh, their concern is survey research these institutions concern is survey research they are not preoccupied with the, uh, the greeks greeks uh, or greek concerns or otherwise called abstract theories they were not uh, concerned with abstract theories like the greek people uh, greek uh, philosophers rather they went to the field and collected data so in 1969 Uh, ICSS are founded Indian Council for Social Science Research that's a research council dominated by political science and uh, sociology Indian Council of Social Science Research they fund uh, social science research but only for empirical researchers that is survey research and on the foot lines of uh, behavioral movement you will see that lot of survey research institutions were founded in india for example uh, the madras institute for development studies madras institute for development studies mids in 1970 it was founded and center for social studies surat that is a surat based uh, social science research institution center for social studies 1969 center for St development studies k n raj who came back from uh, you know you know uh, del d school founded uh, empirical survey research think tank called center for uh, development studies csds sorry cds cds center for development studies to under 1970 institute uh, institute for social and economic change isac otherwise called isac bangalore uh, ba bangalore 1972 isac short form isac uh, institute for social and economic change bangalore and center for studies in social sciences calcutta very famous institution where uh, you know i think uh, Amar Jaisen was early part of that institution. I'm not sure, uh, you know, Center for Studies or in Social Science, one of leading think tanks, social science think tank in India. Uh, it was founded in 1973. And G B Pant Social Science Institute, Allahabad, 1980. G B Pant Social Science Institute, Allahabad, 1980. Institute of, of Development Studies, Jaipur, 1981. Institute of, of, of Development Studies. Uh, these are very few names to mention, but the the were they they were. Uh, preoccupied with survey research friends and uh, in this uh, the political science and its uh, commanding head in india's public intellectual life was uh, steered by a one intellectual figure rajini kothari rajini kothari it was rajini kothari who gave a distinct uh, position to political science in india's public uh, intellectual life and who uh, himself talked about his struggles to find an address for political science in india in his memoir a 2002 book that was a mem memoirs that was titled memoirs uneasy is the life of the mind that was the title of his book uneasy is the life of the mind it details his role as an institution builder and a conceptual and methodological pioneer in political science and he got a bsc in economics from london school of economics and from england uh, he studied uh, in the in the uh, he studied worked in the university of baroda as a lecturer in political science and economics and he began to uh, write about political issues in the 50s and 60s and it was in 1963 it was uh, his what may be called interest uh, that led to the launching of csds he got a small grant from parks uh, parks and uh, that was for you know uh, <laughs> small grant Uh, to run this institution only for three years, and he was uh, not sure that uh, he will continue with this institution for long because he had to fund, and he was not able to attract good scholars to this institution. But you know, uh, 
CSDS soon became a premier institution of higher learning and research in India because Kothari, because of his uh, style and because of his uh, command on scholarship, good scholarship, attracted so many public intellectuals. Uh, later they all joined as scholars in CSDS and Kothari in a sense became a bridge between American political science and Indian political science. And he spent life in Stanford University in 1964 under the mentorship of Gabriel Almond. He was a dominant figure in comparative politics. And he also spent a year at the Center for Study of Behavioral Sciences at the, uh, Paolo Alto in Michigan. Michigan is said to be the Mecca of survey research. Michigan is said to be the Mecca of Sur Michigan University is said to be the Mecca of survey research where uh, Kothari got training in survey research. And Kothari was also a pioneer of modernization theory in India, a pioneer of modernization theory in India, not only behavioral theories, he was also the pioneer of modern modernization theory on the food lines of general system theory, general system theory. He was influenced by Edward Schultz and uh, Edward Schultz and Talcott Parson, Talcott Parson. Uh, Rajini Kothari has uh, written uh, the book Politics in India which is considered a classic, a classic, a most systematic and comprehensive piece of work. That book will give you a founding understanding about how India's polit politics evolved, how India's politics operate. That was in the, this opened all in the 1960s and friends, in the 60s, at the end of 60s, Vietnam War and in the 70s, you will see, uh, you know, uh, some dramatic world events, Cold War, liberation of Bangladesh, emergency, declaration of emergency by Indira Gandhi, all these led to a watershed in the studies of in the studies in politics. So political science began to be marginalized in the 70s because uh, some of the world events as well as emergency became a stumbling block to political science to offer good scholarship because political science was not able to predict that Indira Gandhi will become a despot and declare emergency. Political science was not able to understand the consequences of liberation of Bangladesh. So friends, what happened is that in the 70s, the mystique of the developmental stage, the Nehruvian stage got uh, lost its glamour. Nehruvian idea of a planned, develop uh, planned development lost its glamour. In the 70s, the embassies of political science shifted from science to normativity, normativity. The emphasis of political science shifted from science to normativity. And doing political science in the form of electoral studies became unattractive. Doing political science in the form of electoral studies became unattractive. So political scientists began to search for new concerns. And friends, in the 1990s, or in the end of 80s, you will see identity politics began to dominate in Indian uh, political science, identity politics. So caste politics developed in India, mandalization took place. So it began to attract scholars, political science scholars. So there is the politics in the 90s. And the food lines of this new identity politics, the development of identity politics, you will see that 
Selig Harrison. Selig Harrison has written a book, India, the most dangerous decades. The most dangerous decades. That is published in 1960. It offered a description of the balkanizing tendencies in Indian politics. How identity politics emerges, how it is going to affect India's political scenario. And Paul Brass, the Paul Brass, the famous book, Language, Religion and Politics in North India, a very famous book that began to address issues other than the issues which earlier political science addressed in India. Like Selig Harrison's The Most Dangerous Decade or Paul Brass, Language, Religion and Politics that was published in 1974 and Ashudosh Vashni Ashudosh Vashni in 2002 published a very interesting book, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India. It's a very interesting book that was uh, an unconventional issue handled by political scientists. Uh, political science was early looking at the constitutional process, parliament, uh, legislation, uh, you know, judiciary, government. These were the concerns of early political scientists. Now you will see that Ashudosh Vashni studied uh, ethnicity in India and published Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India. In 2003, Paul Brass again published The Production of Hindu-Muslim Violence. The Production of Hindu-Muslim Violence. And in 2004, Stephen Wilkinson, Stephen Wilkinson published Words and Violence, Electoral Competition and Ethnic Rights in India. Friends, uh, th thereby uh, identity politics began to find position in the political science vocabularies in, uh, in India. So these books contributed to the growth of political science, Indian political science literature. And you will see Partha Chatterjee. Partha Chatterjee is coming to the scenario and post-colonial studies started in the 1990s, post-colonial studies. And Partha Chatterjee, uh, one of the members of the famous Sabatan Study School, uh, Sabatan Studies Collective. So he holds a PhD in political science. And his first volume, the first volume, Sabatan Studies appeared in the 1982. First volume uh, appeared uh, in the 1982, titled Sabatan Studies. And Partha Chatterjee, along with Sudipta Kaviraj, uh, were the uh, political scientists who who began to look at India from a post-colonial perspective. So new vocabularies, new voc uh, methodologies, new way of looking at political science began to find a uh, place in India's political science research. So Chatterjee proposed a famous concept of derivative discourse. Chatterjee proposed the famous uh, concept called derivative discourse. Ashish Nandi proposed his concept of intimate enemy. And Homi Bhabha proposed a famous concept of mimicry. So uh, these were conceptual categories uh, proposed uh, in post-colonial um, studies, post-colonial studies. And a lot of, you know, you know uh, studies about post-colonial India including Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. I remember when I was a degree student uh, in Indian academics, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak's one essay was very interesting and we were not able to understand what it is. Uh, it was an essay titled, Can Sabatan Speak? That was an essay written by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, uh, Can Sabatan Speak? That uh, attracted much discussion in the Indian academia. That was when I was doing uh, my BA program as well as my MA program. Uh, this was an interesting discussion in India. Can Sabatan speak? So uh, new issues began to uh, find place in India's political science scholarship. But my friends, Rudolf is concluding his essay uh, on intellectual history of the study of Indian politics by stating uh, that uh, the, in, the, the examination of the intellectual history of the study of Indian politics has followed how methodologies shifted from time to time. That he was focusing on how methodologies of 
looking at issues shifted from time to time. So from era to era, Rudolph argued that looking and studying Indian politics methodologically changed. Earlier, it was uh, classicism in the colonial era. That in the colonial era, political science studied classic literature. And the years following independence, political science were more concerned about institutionalism. How institutions shape society in India. And in the 70s, you will see a behavioral movement took place in India's political science. And in the 80s onwards, you will see identity politics started. Identity politics started in India's political science. And in the 90s onwards, you will see post-colonial studies started in India's political science. See, uh, this is the you know, timeline. Uh, Rudolph is arguing that in the colonial era, political science was concerned with the classic literature, studying classic literature. Uh, you remember uh, Orientalism, Occidentalism debate. In the early era, it was uh, Oriental literature. That was the focus of uh, studies. But after Macaulay's minutes was passed, Indian universities started to, you know, inculcate Occidental values in Indians who go to uh, European style education institutions where they study European literature, Shakespeare and the Western Euro Greek classics, Sophocles, etc. Uh, Shakespeare, etc. And later, India became independent. Institutional approach was adopted by political science. And in the 50s, 60s, you will see behavioral movement uh, began to find place in Indian political science. And in the 80s, identity politics started to find place. And finally, in the 90s, post-colonial studies started to find place. And this is the lineage of, you know, friends political science, Indian political science, according to uh, Rudolf and Rudolf. Friends, now the floor is open for discussion. The lecture is, sorry, the reading is over.